Welcome back to part two. Um, we're going to now look at some in situ testing methods where we combine our mechanical testing with some other form of observation on the on the sample while it's under loading. And I'm going to give some examples really to, to illustrate this that, that, that come from activities in, in my group. So the first very obvious uh, thing you could do is, is simply use a, an optical uh, imaging system. So um, a lens of some sort coupled with a, uh, a digital camera just to record what happens on the sample as we go along. And this is some work from uh, a DPhil student of mine a while ago, uh, Yi Guo, um, looking at titanium and just using a, a simple um, camera with a, with a lens in front of it, optic system in front of it that magnifies the sample to some extent. So it's a, a fairly low uh, magnification optical imaging system. Uh, you can see in here that the sample um, is a, approximately uh, three millimeters across and you can pick out some grain structure in here uh, in the system that was that was etched already. There's some patterning on the surface as well that was was there for for DIC work and that was just uh, actually toner cartridge. Um, the print from that, the, the ink from that, uh, is little uh, particles that adhere absolutely to everything actually including including samples so we were using those as things that we could track the the strain evolution in this in this sample um, I'm just going to start the the video uh, and this was just tested under uh, under tensile loading so we've just got grips that are off off the shot at either end uh, that are moving uh, apart from each other and uh, not much happens to start with but eventually you should start seeing what you'd expect to uh, to see as a, as a polycrystal starts deforming. So in some grains, like as over here, we start forming uh, slip features and you can see it being picked up in other places. If you watch in this area here, you'll see something else uh, shoot into to play at, at some point. There we go. Uh, and that, that happened very abruptly. That's actually a twin uh, that was generated. It extends a little bit further on through the um, through the system. So this um, sort of form of imaging then ties in with the mechanical test data. Uh, we get some some imaging of what's going on so that we can see the plasticity, we can see which grains start deforming and actually we could we could work in and interrupt the test at a, um, at a reasonable point uh, and then these samples went in for doing some some other bits of, uh, uh, of microscopic um, investigation. So quite simple to do. Uh, magnifications you can get rather rather better than this but typically you are looking at, at quite large grained samples to be able to work out what's going on on a grain by grain basis. Of course if you were interested in what was happening around a hole or a notch you might not need that and as I say uh, there's some patterning on here that would allow us to uh, to actually from the distortion of that pattern under load uh, measure the strain across the whole field so actually grain to grain strain variations could be could be measured through something called digital image correlation. Well what else could we do? Here's another example. So this is an example where the observations are now uh, with x-ray diffraction and this was um, some test work uh, with Dave Collins who's a postdoc with me um, a while back um, looking at biaxial uh, deformation of uh, predominantly of steel samples. So here's our sample in a load frame. So this is a Shimadzu load frame that normally sits in our mechanical testing lab, but we took it down the road to uh, to, to Harwell uh, to the the diamond light source, and this is in a large um, observation hutch at, at the end of a of an X-ray beam line. Uh, there's a detector in here, the black feature behind. The sample is a detector. Um, there's an optical system down here that's looking up here to do some DIC on the sample. And the sample is in this load frame. It's a uniaxial load frame. So uh, this cross head will move uh, upwards. And there are a series of things in here. And I've got an animation on the next slide um, that actually turns that uniaxial motion upwards into also pulling on these, uh, these side arms. So the sample in here you can see is a cruciform um, shape and the deformation that we want the biaxial loading ends up 
uh, being carried by this central region which is thinned down. So if we uh, zoom in a bit on, on that, you can see here, here are the grips. Here's the region that's uh, deforming. It's got some slots in it this way and this way, front and back, uh, and thinned down into a disc that's rather smaller on there. If we do a finite element analysis, you can see that the stresses are concentrated here in that central disc. So that's the thing that should deform first, not the, not the arms. There's some concentration here at these, these corners. It's inescapable, actually, uh, but rather more intense uh, concentration of stresses in the middle here, which is where it where it yields first. So here's a look at the, the device. So as this crosshead moves up, it forces uh, these linear bearings to run down, constrained on these arms here, and therefore pulls outwards on the two uh, the two um, horizontal arms uh, and loads the thing in, in uh, the middle here. This is set up here with these at, at 45 degrees so that you get as much movement out of uh, the lateral arms as you do the vertical ones. If you change the slope in here actually you can change the ratio of how much you're pulling in this direction compared to that direction and we've played around with that a fair bit. So the experiment then, uh, an x-ray beam 80 uh, kilovolts or uh, kV or so comes through here. Uh, we get diffraction from all the from crystals within this, crystals in all sorts of different directions or orientations within this, and so we get uh, Debye Shearer uh, cones that intersect our 2D detector and form these rings. And um, essentially, uh, what we also have in here is a beam stop so that we don't have our really intense x-ray beam striking the detector because it fries the detector so it's important you, you block out that uh, direct beam um, lower intensity in the diffraction rings um, and you can uh, then record these diffraction rings as you deform uh, the sample and of course what this does is it tells you the ring will distort as you start stretching the material this way the despacing will open up because of the loading uh, and if the despace opens up then the diffraction ring will, will change, the diffraction angles change, and in fact actually these, these rings slightly uh, come back in again. What we could also do actually is take that out the way, and we had another um, radiographic imaging system, so just a shadow casting image um, back here on a, another detector behind, and that allowed us to, to follow actually the shape change in here, so the plastic strains being uh, pushed onto the sample. We looked at all sorts of different um, strain paths and the idea was uh, to, to explore this thing here, a forming limit, and see if we could defeat the forming limit. So um, on here we have a major strain, I've, I've lost the other axis, this is a minor strain, and essentially this region uh, down here in the sort of light purpley colour is safe, the material won't fail, but if I extend up into this region here I'll start failing the material and that, of course that, that's a limit on the formability. And we explored uh, with this rig what was going on as we took different strain paths uh, through here, looking at the build-up of lattice strains uh, and therefore the stresses within the system. And actually what we also did is looked at ways like this, where if you take a, um, a two-step approach, so you load in a uniaxial path first and then a biaxial path afterwards, you can get up here to much higher major strains that actually exceed um, the, the, the sort of single step um, forming limit diagram. So there's a, uh, a ductility gain in here of about a factor of two. What else can we do going back to microscopy? Well, if we make a much more compact um, a tensile stage, then actually we can do uh, observations in the SEM. Uh, and here's an example here where as well as uh, deforming things, we have a heating element underneath which just heats the uh, the sample in here from the bottom um, and if it's a, uh, a metallic sample then actually you don't get much of a heat gradient so uh, a temperature gradient so uh, you get a, a uniform temperature through here. Um, an important tweak on how these sorts of in situ frames work is instead of having one fixed grip and another crosshead that moves relative to it if you have that the trouble is bit of material that you're looking at 
as you deform as you load it tends to move off with the with the uh, with the moving crosshead and moves out of out of shot if you're zoomed right in tight so what you tend to do instead is you actually power uh, and actuate the motion of both grips so that they both move equally uh, fast away from each other so that the bit in the middle that you focus in on should stay in the middle it should stay in frame okay uh, just an example here of, of, of what you can see. This is a, a nickel-based alloy. Um, you can see an EVSD map of the, the microstructure in here. And uh, if we just look at what happens, this is tested at room temperature. Series of images as we, as we go. Uh, you can see the stretch. You can see eventually we'll get uh, some ductility and failure um, uh, through here. Um, if I compare that with then a test, same material, same sort of microstructure, obviously a slightly different patch of microstructure, uh, but now tested at 700 degrees. Uh, again, if we run that, you'll see the deformation is somewhat, somewhat different. You can see things uh, failing here on, on grain boundaries rather more. Okay. And um, what uh, Yuanbo, uh, Yuanbo Tang, who is a Phil student with myself and Roger Reed is still working with Roger's group up at Begbrook. Um, what he was interested in is whether we could improve the material to, to uh, mitigate that failure mode. And so we'll take another test at high temperature where he's generated a, a microstructure where the boundaries are not, are not so planar. They have some, some oscillations, some serrations on them to try and key things uh, together. And if we look at this system, what you'll hopefully pick out just quickly by looking at this is that although we do get failures at the boundaries it's not as marked a failure mode it's rather suppressed uh, and we get greater elongation of the sample um, than we would do in the uh, in the, the planar boundary um, situation okay so lots of things you can do with this again this can be linked up to patterning the sample surface so that you can do dic digital image correlation to measure the strains within individual grains uh, and how they vary. You can do that at very high resolution. The, the strain mapping is now controlled by the SEM um, uh, resolution and the resolution of whatever patterning you put down on the sample surface. Um, I'll just leave you with a, a couple of examples here. I've, I've given you the clips in here. I'm not going to play these. Um, uh, here, but of course you can go. Our tendency in the in the research lab is to go to smaller and smaller length scales to understand the the mechanics of how different elements of the microstructure work. But if you're an engineer generating an aircraft, you might want to do tests at a much much larger uh, length scale. And here's a couple of uh, links through to some YouTube YouTube videos of testing uh, to to overloads the wings. Hopefully you can see in here there's a fuselage of an aircraft, uh, a wing coming out here with lots of uh, pulleys and tie points to the wing uh, so that you can overload and deflect uh, this wing and make sure that your, uh, your whole uh, aircraft has integrity. Uh, the second link in here looks at um, doing fatigue testing essentially, so uh, mimicking the, the taxi flight landing sequence uh, of, of loading on the, uh, on the wings and accelerating it. Um, to generate uh, fatigue and, and life assessment of the, the structure as a whole. OK, well, we'll stop there for part two uh, and part three we'll pick up next and we'll look at some indentation testing methods.